This is the Mormon Mixed Faith Marriage Podcast with Certified Life Coach, Brooke Booth, episode number 107. This podcast episode is all about advice. Now, before we get into the advice and my little monologues about the advice, I'm going to say a few things about advice. Advice is something that needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Advice is something that works for some people, but doesn't work for all people. Advice is often very freely given and freely taken. And that's the part I would question. I know definitely growing up in the LDS society, marriage advice was like one of our favorite topics. We were always talking about marriage, at least definitely. That's how I was socialized through primary and young women's and YSA was it was all for the end goal of that temple wedding, that temple ceiling. And so marriage advice was handed around like candy. And a lot of advice is excellent and well-meaning and really insightful. And some advice is, well, frankly, bad. But primarily advice is often individual. What I mean by that is something that would be good advice for some person might be really bad advice for another person. Like it's kind of tailored. It doesn't, it's not a one size fits all. And I think that's where it can get tricky is because a lot of times when advice is given, it's given in the sense that it's one size fits all. And it's not, it's just not. And so I want to go through some pretty common advice and talk about the assumptions underneath it and my thoughts on it. But it makes me think of when my husband and I were getting married, we had, you know, the typical reception and we had, we had two, of course, one in Michigan where my family was and one in Wyoming where his family was. And we had purchased this book. I remember we both thought it looked cool. (laughs) And we purchased this book that we wanted to have at the two receptions for people to write down their marriage advice for us so that we could learn from those around us, from our family, from our friends, from our loved ones, that we can learn from them and gain their perspective and insight. I, but my husband keeps track of this book. I, I asked him to find it for me so I could use it on this podcast. Sadly, we were not able to locate the book, but luckily I have the internet and Facebook and lots of people to ask this question. So I went and gathered some advice that people have given me and I'm going to share it here. And I'm going to talk about it. Now, a lot of this space isn't specific to a mixed faith marriage. And I don't think it really matters because this is marriage advice. And if you notice a lot of the work we do with mixed faith marriage is really just marriage stuff. So make your own connections to your mixed faith marriage, but I'm going to take a little um, break this week. And we're not going to be talking exclusively about mixed faith marriage because this is more general marriage advice, but I guarantee Um, it's going to apply to you. Okay. Here's some advice that you've been given and hear me on this. Not just because I'm sharing it doesn't mean it's all bad advice. Advice is sometimes good and sometimes bad. Sometimes applies and sometimes doesn't sometimes works for some people and doesn't work for other people. So we're just going to look at it through that lens. Here's one. I definitely heard never go to bed angry. And again, for some people, this can be amazing advice, but for somebody like me, it means I should work through all my tough stuff when I'm mentally and emotionally exhausted. Okay. Not the best advice, right? But again, doesn't mean it doesn't work for some people. It's just one of those things that I want. When you think about the advice that you have lived by, I just want you to look at it again and say, does this work for me? 
Here's another one. And, and I'll talk more about this one because it comes up and what some other people have submitted is divorce is not an option. Definitely. I was given this as advice. And as I was thinking about it, it means you should eliminate choice after you actually have the data you need to decide whether this marriage is viable or not. Interesting. But I just want to give those as two examples um, before we dive in. Okay. So what I did is I reached out to um, a whole bunch of people and I asked them to give me their marriage advice so I could use it here. And all the people sent me, I had totally heard like nothing here was super surprising. So I think you'll, you'll resonate with that. The first one I want to, these are in no particular order of importance. I just, I'm just doing in the order I got them. But the first one was the most striking to me because I didn't even see it as advice, but it totally is. So this one person just wrote these two words, get married. And she's right. Like, this is advice. This is advice we have to just get married. When I look at a piece of advice, I like to say, get curious about what are my, what are the assumptions underneath it? What are the assumptions underneath it? And do those assumptions apply to me? What do I think of those assumptions? Do they make sense to, for me? Are they in alignment with what I believe in the kind of life I want to live? So there's a lot of assumptions with this piece of advice of get married. Um, the assumption is that marriage is the best path to happiness, that it's the foundation of our society, that it's the only way to be fulfilled, that it is like the highest and best option for you as an adult grown woman. These are interesting assumptions to look at. Now, this may very well be true for some people, but it may not be true for everybody. I was really surprised by that one because it's one I had totally uh, taken for granted as even a piece of advice, but it is. Okay, here's one. Never talk about divorce. I had an institute teacher tell us, this is what somebody wrote in. I had an institute teacher tell us to never even say the D word because it drives away the spirit. I have found that recognizing divorce as an option has made our choice to stay together actually feel like a choice. And I don't feel stuck in my marriage. I'm staying because I want to, not because I have no other choice. I've totally heard this. And I even mentioned it earlier. Divorce is not an option. She says, never talk about divorce. This one's so interesting because in the work I do with clients, the, the belief never talk about divorce or divorce is not an option totally works for some people. It helps instill commitment. It helps them feel focused and really invested in the marriage. For some people, like the person who wrote this in, it steals, it robs them of opting in. It robs them of feeling like they actually have a choice to stay. This has definitely been my experience too. I'm choosing to stay because I can leave feels very different than I'm choosing to stay. But if I leave, I'm a horrible person or I'm making a wrong decision or I'm doing something unforgivable. Those have very different feelings in my body. And choosing to stay because I want to, and because this matters to me and because this is important really helps motivate me to create a higher quality relationship than choosing to stay because otherwise I'll be labeled a bad person or there'll be stigma or people will judge me. I'm not so motivated to create a high quality relationship. It's more of an endure grind type of a relationship. So again, it's not that that's just plain up bad advice. It's that it just fits differently for different people. What works for you is I think the question behind all of this. And here's a really interesting one. I have a really good friend who was, when she got engaged to her husband was told not to marry him because she was three years older than him. Now, what's particularly fascinating about this is it's not surprising. Like I wasn't shocked that that was advice that she was given. What's interesting to me is that that friend of mine and her husband have perhaps one of the healthiest marriages I have ever seen. Truly. 
truly like perhaps one of the most best um, abilities to communicate and to share and to work through challenging things and to face challenging things together as a partnership than pretty much any other couple that I know that well. And it's interesting that that three-year age difference was completely material. What's also particularly interesting is my husband's six years older than me and nobody blinked an eye at that. Um, I think that just speaks a little bit to some of the double standards we have in our society about men and women. But again, it's, it's an interesting thing to question the assumptions underneath it. Okay, this one's really interesting. That I need to greet my husband with a happy face. That's in quotes when he gets home. This implied having a full face of makeup and a positive attitude, no matter how my day had gone. Okay, I have many thoughts on this. <laughs> Recently I coached somebody on how she greets her husband at the end of the day. And I want to be really cautious about this because for some people, it's a wonderful time to connect reconnect with their spouse at the end of the day. If it is, if that's something that works for you and for the couple, like if you want to, because that's something you enjoy and because that's something that adds value and connection for you and your husband, but this is not across the board. This is not one size fits all for some people, what this turns into and I'm one of these people is it becomes like a people pleasing, you know, the full face of makeup, positive attitude, no matter how the day is gone. Like, to me, that seems like people pleasing. Like you need to appear a certain way, even if that's not an honest representation of who you are. And certainly don't ask for and communicate what you might need from your spouse. Because that would not be, you know, meeting him with this positive attitude. Can that can be really interesting in a relationship when we don't feel like we have space to show up as who we really are, to share how we're really feeling, to be honest about our lived experience where we have to put up a mask or a facade and pretend to be somebody we're not so that we don't cause any discomfort in our spouse. Now that's a very interesting situation. So again, this advice might be really good and really bad all at the same time. What, how does it work for you? Is it creating a place where you have emotional connection and chance to have that time together every day? Or is it causing you to people please and put on a mask and hide from your spouse and not letting the truth be discussed and work through and manage. Okay. Next piece of advice I got divorce my husband for having a porn habit. I want to talk about this one. I've heard it too. I've heard all of these, but this one's particularly interesting because really what it's touching on are there are legitimate reasons for divorce and there are illegitimate reasons for divorce. And this type of conversation is fascinating. What do we deem as legitimate reasons to divorce somebody? And what do we deem as illegitimate reasons to divorce somebody? So much that can be said around this. Obviously in this case, the, the advice is that having a porn habit is a legitimate reason to divorce somebody. And I'm not saying it is, or it isn't. That's just the assumption that this advice is presenting with. I'm, I think a lot of times we want other people to give legitimacy to our decisions. And I think this is in large part what's going on there. Like when I think about like the, what are legitimate reasons for divorce? Again, no one size fits all there. <laughs> But sometimes you'll hear, well, was he hitting you or was she hitting you? Like, as if, if there's physical abuse that somehow justifies things where financial abuse wouldn't like justifies a reason to get divorced or not to get divorced. That becomes an interesting area because 
Now there becomes like a right way and a wrong way and you have to get it just right. And a lot of times the right way and the wrong way are based on other people's experience and other people's opinion and not your lived experience and not what's best and healthiest for you. So again, what are the assumptions behind the advice and does that make sense for you? So another assumption behind this one is that porn is somehow morally corrupt. It will ruin your family. These are things I was certainly taught. And maybe that's very much the case in your lived experience. And maybe it's not, you know, are the assumptions true? Do they apply here? Does that advice make sense for you in your situation? You know, I just have to add when I was like getting advice growing up and I think back to that book, I never once thought like, that's bad advice. I'm never going to do that. I just was like, oh, it's advice. I need to like take it to heart and consider it. I'm just asking you to look at things twice. That's all. Okay. A few more pieces of advice here. Don't bring up an issue that your spouse is causing unless you can also take some blame as the wife. You could probably say this the other way around. So you can also take some blame as the husband, but obviously it was a female who wrote this down. This one's interesting to me because I can see the reasoning behind it. You know, this idea of like, not just blaming the other person, but I also think this is a bit too reductive, perhaps like don't bring up an issue unless you can take some blame. Even if you have no blame, like that's probably too reductive. I am a big fan of watching blame and, you know, wanting to just dump blame on other people or on ourselves. And and doing that categorically. And I think that's probably what this advice is trying to caution against, but maybe being a little too reductive because the assumption is that the blame is always maybe equally shared or always shared to some degree. And maybe that's not the case. I think it's worth looking at and doing like a clear analysis of but that doesn't mean once you do the analysis, there's going to be some easy 50, 50 split. I think it's good to question, like, just because there's an issue, like I would even question the assumption of like, why do we need to take, why does there need to be blame assigned at all? What does it mean when we assign blame? Are we also assigning responsibility for who needs to resolve and fix this? Those are interesting assumptions to question too. Okay, next piece of advice that I should give my husband sex whenever he wants it or needs it, denying my feelings, health, or needs. Yes, I've heard this one. Yes, I've definitely seen it in my work with clients. There is certainly an idea that there's entitlement to sex once marriage has taken place. I see that entitlement can definitely diminish enjoyment and pleasure and make sex a chore for the partner who um, is sort of at the effect of the entitlement. And I think that has real impacts in a relationship. So again, is like, what are the assumptions under there? The assumption is that there's entitlement to sex. The assumptions are that, um, your husband's sexual needs are more important than you. Now that's an interesting assumption as well. And I would question those assumptions. Maybe this is great advice for you. Maybe this isn't. Okay, here's my favorite one. If I put these in order of importance, this is the one I'd put first. Happy wife, happy life. Now, we don't say happy husband, happy life, but I think it's implied. We hear it more in terms of happy wife, happy life. So that's how I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to be really blunt on this one. The happy wife, happy life puts the onus of emotional labor on the wife in the relationship. And this can make men or husbands emotionally dependent on their wife. It, it can infantilize or make him like a child. Again, this isn't really great for sex. Also, what's interesting is if the wife isn't happy, then that's a problem that needs to be fixed ASAP. That can mean that she is not given her the opportunity to experience the full range of human emotions that she needs to stay in a narrow bandwidth of the emotional experience because 
happy wife equals happy life. <laughs> and that can be very um, difficult. It can create feelings of inadequacy if she doesn't feel anything but happy. It can create feelings of guilt if she feels a negative emotion. It can create feelings of feeling stuck or judged or disapproved of when she experiences a very normal human emotion that somehow falls on the negative side of the emotional spectrum. I think this is a piece of advice that I would be very cautious in passing on to my children. And I'd be very cautious in how I um, internalize it myself. Okay, next piece of advice. Since your husband presides, he gets the last say. Um, this is sort of like the buck stops here. Somebody has to make the final say. You know, the assumption under this is that a hierarchical um, organization is the best, is the best way to make decisions, is the best way to be in relationship, is the best way to run a family. And maybe that works really well for some people, but maybe that doesn't work really well for other people. So I would look at that assumption of that, you know, that the hierarchy and that somebody gets to have the final say um, as the assumption, does that work for you? Does that work for you? I would argue that a partnership doesn't have that type of hierarchy. And that's a really interesting way of being in relationship. I'll also say it's a really challenging way of being in relationship. It takes a lot of skills and work that we're not often modeled in our society because our society is very much set up in a hierarchical way. We're very familiar with hierarchical relationships. We're very familiar with hierarchical um, patterns and decision-making and being in a partnership is a bit counter culture. Okay, next piece of advice. If he looks at porn or has an affair, it's because you weren't taking care of his needs. So this one definitely ties into how young women are taught modesty. You know, that women are the gatekeepers or they're in charge of men's sexual desires, sexual needs, sexual arousal. Um, so there's that assumption that women are responsible or in charge of men's sexuality managing it, um, turning it on or off and all of that. I think this plays into men feeling entitled to sex once there's marriage or that they can't help themselves. And that plays into the entitlement. I think this also infantilizes men. You know, it makes them less like have less autonomy over their own bodies, over their own thoughts, over their own feelings. And it definitely puts way too much emotional work on women. Okay. Um, here's an interesting one. Only missionary position with sex. Anything else is sinful. This, the, the whole history behind missionary position is fascinating because the, the missionaries, the Christian missionaries would go out, you know, in the colonialization period and teach the missionary position because they would see other positions. And that was deemed, I don't know, unchristian or something. So like, there's a reason we think that there's a reason we think that it, it's part and parcel to, um, you know, the, the enculturation we receive from just being in a Christian worldview. But again, what's the assumptions underneath that? The assumptions are that doing things in a quote unquote different or foreign way is bad or sinful and not approved by God. That's interesting. It's interesting to look at those assumptions and see, does that make sense with me? Okay. Last piece of advice. Um, when we got married, I was told always to go to bed at the same time. I think that is great, but my husband works graves for the first four years we were married. So we definitely didn't go to bed at the same time. <laughs> and again, so many assumptions here, right? The assumption that maybe you should be doing 
um, lots of things together, that you should um, maybe be having sex every night. I don't know what the assumption is. There's some, like everybody's going to internalize their own assumptions, but there's a lot of interesting assumptions here. You know, that it's not good to have different schedules or it's not good to have different bedtimes. This one's really interesting to me too, because like different people have different circadian rhythms. Different people have different preferences. Different people need um, the amounts of times together and amounts of times apart to take care of themselves. I, I once heard somebody talk about this. It was another coach and her husband would never go to bed with her. And it just ate her up, caused her so much pain and sorrow and frustration. When she finally talked to him about it, he just mentioned that that was the time of day when he could have his alone time. And that was important to him to have that time to just reconnect with himself without other people being around. So again, what are the assumptions and do those assumptions work for you? Hey, okay, lots of advice. You're probably thinking of advice you've received or advice that you've given or advice that you've just generally heard. And I just want you to think about it in this way. Like, what are the assumptions underneath the advice? And am I okay with that? Do I like it? Some advice you've received is amazing and run with it and keep telling it to yourself. Other advice may need to be let you can let go of and you can move on and not let that be something that is part of how you think about your relationship anymore. I hope this is thought provoking for you. So you can go back and think about your own marriage and some things that have been really beneficial to you and some things that have maybe caused you to stub your toe against, and you can just let that go. Okay. If you want to work with a coach on your mixed faith marriage, as always, feel free to reach out to me at brookeboothcoaching.com and you can learn about the ways of working with me there. All right. Wishing you the best in your Mormon mixed faith marriage.